I believe that what's happened can be uh, reasonably well analysed using the fairly standard tools of economics that you can found, find in a textbook. Uh, it's a story of individual incentives, informational asymmetries and collective action problems set against the background of an excessively optimistic assessment of risk born of a period of unusually benign macroeconomic performance and the creation of innovative but ultimately destructive financial instruments. What the economic profession failed to see was the systemic consequences of these microeconomic frictions. And although there were a few wise owls around who saw, who saw some of the risks built in, I don't think anybody can really claim to have seen the whole picture in advance. There were some observations regarding the implications of the crisis for the future development of uh, economics. In all probability, the Great Panic and the Great Contraction of 2008 are going to join the Great Depression of the 1930s and the Great Inflation of the 1970s as discipline-defining events. The struggle to understand and deal with the Great Depression led to the invention of macroeconomics as a distinct branch of the subject. Uh, and in the case of the Great Inflation, economic theory for one of its leading events was the development of the natural rate hypothesis foreshadowing the, the subsequent uh, inflation takeoff. Uh, and then the subsequent decades were spent with refining our understanding of the inflationary process. Uh, so the question is, what's the, what will be the legacy of the Great Panic and the Great Contraction? Uh, well, first, uh, in my view, and I hope um, I've made it clear uh, in the lecture, it'd be a mistake to look for a single guilty culprit, attractive though that might be. Underestimation of risk born of the great moderation, loose monetary policy in the United States, and a perverse pattern of international capital flows, together provided fertile territory for the emergence of a credit asset price bubble. And the creation of an array of complex new assets that were supposed to spread risk more widely then ended up destroying information about the scale and location of losses, which proved to be crucial when the market turned. Uh, and then an array of distorted incentives led the financial system to build up excessive leverage, increasing the vulnerabilities when asset prices began to fall. This is important from the point of view of thinking about how you respond to the crisis in terms of policy to realise that there are multiple causes. There won't be one single silver bullet that uh, 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 we need to introduce that will prevent a recurrence of lots of actions required. Uh, secondly, the, the economics profession has oversold the virtues of unfettered financial markets. Uh, economists usually start from a presumption that markets work best when they're left to themselves, unless there are obvious market failures present. Uh, by the same token, even though not strictly the case in theory, we usually start from a presumption that expanding the range of available securities is a good thing. But yet, clearly, that's resulted in a deeply unsatisfactory outcome on this occasion. Now, one view that you do hear expressed, uh, say by you know, Bob Schiller and George Akerlof, uh, is that we need to bring psychology and the insights of behavioural economics into the study of financial markets. Now, that may indeed be part of producing a richer and more accurate description of financial market behaviour, particularly in regard to expectations of formation. Uh, but as I hope I've made clear today, I think distorted incentives, information failures, collective action problems, network effects, all things that we can understand with the existing tools of economics uh, have also played a large part in recent events. So our standard toolkit should get us a long way in understanding what happened, and that's one step on the road uh, to avoiding the repeat. Uh, third, we need to pay more heed to the lessons of history. Uh, financial booms and busts have occurred uh, with some regularity, at least since tulip mania in 1636-1837. Actually, if you go back to uh, uh, writings on Roman history, you can find uh, the equivalent of banking crises then. So, uh, yet we, tre we tend to treat financial uh, booms and busts as pathologies uh, that happen at other times or in other places. Not a central part of the teaching of the discipline if you read, read a standard introductory macro textbook, it probably doesn't uh, uh, mention uh, 
financial rooms and busts at all. Um, but I think the frequency with which uh, in practice they've actually happened suggests that we will, will be better advised to think of them as a central feature of capitalist economies that our models ought to aspire to explain. Uh, fourth, we need to put credit back into macroeconomics in a meaningful way. Uh, financial intermediaries are conspicuous by their absence in the workhorse New Keynesian, New Classical Dynamics, stochastic General Equilibrium Model. Uh, the focus there is on intrinsic dynamics resulting from intertemporal decision making in the face of a variety of adjustment costs and impediments to price adjustment, and, but there are no financial frictions to speak of. Now that such a framework is developed, I don't think it's altogether surprising uh, given the great inflation and the subsequent great moderation. Uh, but the fact that financial intermediation plays a, a negligible role uh, in Mike Woodford's magisterial uh, state-of-the-art book, Interest in Prices, I think speaks volumes for uh, where the, uh, the discipline currently is. There are some authors that have sought to introduce financial frictions into the standard framework, but in virtually all of this literature, financial intermediaries, if they're present at all, are very simple institutions, and any incentive or information problems relate purely to uh, what the borrower does. Uh, but much of what's happened recently is best understood in terms of frictions that lie within the financial sector itself, at the interface between the lender and the bank, rather than than between the bank and the borrower. And developing macroeconomic models with a sufficiently rich specification of the financial intermediation sector that captured the variety of incentive distortions and information frictions that I've been discussing, I think it represents a very challenging research agenda for the future. We're starting to see some work uh, uh, along that road, but there's a long way to go. So perhaps some of you uh, your future careers are going to contribute to meeting that agenda, uh, and in doing so, that will help us to avoid a future repeat of our present troubles. Thank you.